Good evening. My name is Dr. Brian Henning. I am Professor of Philosophy and Environmental Studies at Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington, where I direct the Gonzaga Center for Climate Society and the Environment. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, wherever you find yourself. We're glad that you chose to spend a little bit of time to, together with us tonight talking about important issues related to climate society and the environment. I'd like to recognize as we begin that Gonzaga resides on the ancestral homelands of the Spokane tribal people, uh, the people of the river. We're thankful for all of the work that they have done to steward these lands over generations since time immemorial. And we hope to continue in their tradition of caring for the earth and land and the water in our region. Gonzaga Climate Center was launched in April of 2021 to host events related to climate society and the environment, also to work in areas related to climate literacy and climate resilience. And we're really excited to be able to host a, a series of talks, including this one tonight. Just to look forward, in addition to the event that we have with Dr. Bloomfield tonight, we also are excited to host author and activist Paul Kingsnorth, who will be discussing on, on February 24th, Confessions of a Recovering Environmentalist at noon on a Zoom talk. Uh, please consider registering for that at Gonzaga Climate Center events. And then on March 9th, in person at the, Mar at the uh, Myrtle Wurtz Woltzen Performing Arts Center here on campus at Gonzaga University, we're having Cardinal Michael Cherney on caring for our common home in this world and with this climate. Uh, that's one of the few events that is only in person on campus, not also live streamed online. We hope that if you're in the region that you are able to join us. Uh, the tickets for that event are going quickly. We have uh, maybe just a little less than 100 tickets left uh, for that event. Then on March 20th, we're excited to host Kevin Coons, who will be talking about building resilient infrastructure in the face of changing climate. Exciting talk to listen to an entrepreneur and an inventor here in Spokane talking about building resilient infrastructure for the 21st century. And then on April 3rd, Dr. Griffin Thompson, who will be talking about the political and ethical dimensions of the renewable energy transition. Should be an excellent talk. It'll be in person and live stream, as will the talk with Kevin Coons. Uh, both of those talks will be in person as well as live streamed. Uh, as you might imagine, hosting these events uh, doesn't uh, come cheap and is not free. And if you uh, believe in our work and want to support it, uh, you can point your uh, smartphone toward that QR tag on your screen uh, or go to gonzaga.edu slash support climate center to make a donation to make it possible for us to continue our work uh, well into the future. It's my great pleasure tonight to be able to host uh, a wonderful uh, academic and scholar, uh, Dr. Emma Francis Bloomfield, uh, who is Associate Professor of Communication Studies at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. She's a rhetorician who studies environmental communication and scientific controversies. We're inviting her here tonight in part because of, of excitement about her book, Communication Strategies for Climate Skepticism, Religion and the Environment, published in 2019 as part of Rutledge's Advances in Climate Change Research series. We're really happy to have Dr. Bloomfield with us tonight. And please join me, uh, though you can't hear it, Dr. Bloomfield, uh, a raucous applause from uh, our, our large assembled crowd here uh, welcoming you here tonight. Thanks for being with us here at the Climate Center. Thank you so much, Dr. Henning. I really appreciate um, you all being here with, with me tonight on your Tuesday evening. Um, it's really an honor. I definitely want to thank uh, Dr. Henning. I want to thank Dr. Um, and of course, the Gonzaga Center for Climate Society um, and the Environment um, for inviting me to be a part of their speaker series. Um, it's really, truly an honor. So um, I'll go ahead and just uh, get started um, with my talk, which is titled Communication, Christianity, and Climate Change. Um, I'm first gonna start my approach to climate communication, just a brief overview um, of how I think about uh, climate change and climate communication in my research. And then I'm gonna talk about the relationship between Christianity and the environment in my research, as Dr. Henning mentioned, based on my first book, which was published in 2019. And then I'm going to conclude with a little bit about the role of storytelling in environmental narratives, which is part of a current book project that is tentatively titled Science Versus Story. So to get started, I am a communication scholar. And when I think about climate change and the environment and the human relationship to nature, I draw from three uh, interrelated concepts. 
The first is rhetoric. I'm a rhetorician, so I'm interested in the symbols that we use, such as language and visuals, to influence, persuade, and connect with others. So how are we thinking about the words that we're using to describe climate change or to think about nature? What visuals are we using to represent it? And how do we use those to influence one another, to think the way that we think, or to understand our perspective, or simply to connect and make relationships with others? Um, I'm also really interested in stories, the idea that we make sense of the world around us, including the environment through the stories that we hear and that we tell to others and that stories are sense-making tools. I'm also interested in the concept of spheres, which is a communication theory that says communication happens in different figurative arenas based on the people involved, the circumstances, and the levels of expertise changes how we communicate. Um, and because spheres are really important to my talk today, I'm just gonna briefly talk about those a little bit more. So there are three spheres, the personal, public, and technical, you can think of the personal sphere as conversations you have with friends or family members. It might be very colloquial. There might be inside jokes uh, based on what you and your personal relationships know. What I'm more interested in as a rhetorician is the relationship between the public sphere and the technical sphere. The public sphere is a place of accessible communication. If you're speaking in the public sphere, you might think about politicians or journalism or social media where information is accessible and you oftentimes wanna speak in language that a lot of people can understand. The technical sphere alternatively is areas of expertise, um, maybe uh, experts, Dr. scientists. Just yes. uh, confirming, are you showing separate slides or because we're only seeing the title slide? I'm not sure if you're advancing oh, or not. Yes, but I, I am advancing. Uh-oh, we're okay, able to see here. the title I'm slide. I'm so sorry, everybody. I have lots of images of spheres. Let me try and close out. <laughs> and try and start it again. I apologize for that. Thank you for interrupting me, Dr. Henning. Yeah, we had someone nice in the chat uh, mention that to I, I was. Uh, how about? Let's see. I apologize. Let me try and share uh, my screen again here. Uh, how about now? Can you see the overview slide? Let's see. Oh, um, now, now I can see overview. Let's go oh, okay. forward. Go one, one more forward just to make sure that we're. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think it's working now. Okay. I think you're I, good now. Okay. Everyone. I'll let, I'll let you know if it if it goes <laughs> off. Oh, if, <laughs> thank you. Okay. So we're, thank you. No worries. Okay. So we're talking about the spheres. Um, so if we had someone in the technical sphere who uh, was a computer expert, they could tell me why. Right. The Zoom is not working correctly. Um, but so technical spheres where experts live public sphere um, is where uh, general people who um, um, live and communicate. So when we move technical information from the technical sphere to the public sphere, maybe uh, information such as climate science, it goes through a process we call translation um, because we are in a sense translating from one language to another, um, jargon, specialized language and discourse and expertise to publicly accessible language. And you can imagine that when translation occurs, there's an opportunity for controversy. Information can be mistranslated, people cannot understand the translation, or others might directly try to manipulate the relationship um, between the technical and public spheres uh, in order to provide provoke misinformation about the information. So the relationship between the public and technical spheres is quite fraught. And in my research on science, scientific controversies and climate change, I'm really interested in this relationship. So in terms of thinking about productive climate communication between the spheres, uh, there's been a lot of research about a variety of obstacles that inhibit this productive communication, such as economic interests, political interests, anti-elitism, media manipulation and framing, the internet and social media, and of course also religion, which is uh, the thing I'm going to be focusing on most um, in my talk today. 
So in thinking about religion and specifically Christianity's relationship to climate, my first book was really motivated by discourse I was hearing that was very deterministic. In other words, people were saying, oh, Christians think this way. And I was, um, in, in thinking about that question, it was clear to me that you can't just say a Christian necessarily believes something, just like you can't say a climate skeptic necessarily believes something. These aren't deterministic labels. It's instead a wide variety um, of different labels and ideas and interpretations that we might use one term to talk about. So I was reading about and doing research about a Christianity that does lead one to climate skepticism. So Lynn White Jr. Um, famously called Christianity the most anthropocentric religion the world has ever seen. And he argued that a lot of scripture can be interpreted that God planned for man to dominate and rule over the earth and that the earth serves no purpose save to serve man's purpose. And there's, of course, evidence of this type of interpretation. Uh, there are um, leaders in certain denominations of Christianity that espouse skepticism towards climate change. And uh, many polls, including this one by the Pew Research Center, shows that uh, Christian denominations oftentimes have more skepticism and less concern about climate change, um, especially in white communities. But I was also learning about other ways that people were deploying their Christianity or thinking about Christianity in relationship to the environment. Lynn White Jr. acknowledges himself that when one speaks in such sweeping terms about a faith, you need a note of caution. Christianity is complex and its consequences differ. So in the same breath that we can talk about these poles or these de supposed deterministic relationships between faith and climate change, we also see so much of a different tale of Christianity that's motivated by creation care, green evangelicalism, and of course, Laudato Si by Pope Francis, where people are using their faith to mobilize uh, climate action. So again, this was the tale of two Christianities motivated my first book, where I saw religion as both an obstacle and an opportunity, and people were interpreting the same text differently in service of very different environmental arguments. So I'm going to just to give a brief overview of some of the, the key findings of, of that book as an overview of book one before I start talking about um, book two here. So, so in book one, my data was three established and self-proclaimed Christian environmental groups. And then I also did interviews uh, with Christians through online discussion forums and a survey distributed to creation care groups. So I was trying to get a sense of official discourse from Christian groups about the environment and then more sort of informal vernacular on the ground, how are individuals interpreting and enacting their faith. In the first book, I thus created a typology for Christian environmental attitudes based on my research that again, tried to break up this monolithic idea and deterministic idea that just because you're a Christian or a climate skeptic, you necessarily think a certain way. So my typology was the separators, the bargainers, and the harmonizers. And each of the groups that I studied fell into one of these categories, helped to build the categories. And then I also had interviewees that fell across the categories as well. The separators are Christians who, as the name implies, separate climate science and environmentalism from their faith. So they see climate science as opposed to their faith, or they see environmentalism as opposed to their religion. In the discourse or the symbols that separators use when talking about climate change, they tend to use war metaphors and see things through the lens of melodrama, which basically says there's no room for compromise, things are good or things are evil. And they also tend to appeal to authority, namely biblical authority, in order to support their arguments. Um, that also includes them claiming they have the correct uh, and, and, and righteous interpretation um, of texts. So in order to illustrate these features, I'm just going to give a few examples of separator discourse. Um, so the Cornwall Alliance is the exemplar separator. That group argues that the environmental movement is diametrically opposed to the fundamental Christian ethic of the sanctity of human life. So again, this idea of opposition um, good versus evil. We can't compromise with something diametrically opposed to something else. The Cornwall Alliance also notes much of the debate over environmental stewardship is rooted in a clash of worldviews. 
So the Cornwall Alliance uses lots of terms like clash or thinking about fighting or a struggle to emphasize this idea of war. In a conversation I had um, with an interviewee, Benjamin, and that star indicates that this is a pseudonym, um, he told me that God gave us animals and the earth to be used as entertainment and sources of food and that they are not otherwise valuable. And for Benjamin to advocate for a different kind of relationship um, with non-human nature was to go against uh, God's will and, and God's mandates. Alternatively, the bargainers who are also a, a Christian climate skeptics aren't as uh, divisive as the separators, but they still express climate skepticism through their faith. The bargainers negotiate and borrow some aspects of climate science, but not others, um, to fit their Christianity. Instead of war, bargainers tend to use metaphors of revolution. Just give the science time, we'll eventually overthrow our current understanding of climate science, the bargainers believe. They also tend to cherry pick scientific information. So they'll cherry pick a certain person with a PhD or a certain paper or even a certain sentence out of a scientific paper um, to, to support their arguments. So while the separators would not even look typically to scientific information as evidence for their beliefs, the bargainers might cherry pick from that information. And the bargainers often appeal to competing fields. So instead of always speaking through a religious voice, bargainers oftentimes like to borrow from fields they consider to be third or neutral spaces between science and religion. Um, and in my research, that was typically economics. Again, a few examples. Um, the exemplar bargainer is the Acton Institute, and they argued that economics helps us rightly order our stewardship. So again, they're pulling from economics to say, we don't turn necessarily to science or to all science or sort of this uh, science that's been corrupted by environmentalism, but we turn to economics instead as a neutral party that helps us think about our stewardship towards the environment. Another Acton Institute contributor argued, religious climate skeptics are like Christ on the wrong side of history against oppressive regimes. And this for me is just this quintessential uh, example of revolution that with just more time passing, with more research done, religious climate skeptics will be vindicated like Christ as being right and, and being correct and pushing back against what they view as the dominant narrative of climate science. One bargainer I spoke with for the book, Victoria, again, a pseudonym, told me that if science were truly settled about climate change, consensus would be 100%. So for her, the presence of any dissenting scientist, there's one scientist or 1% dissenting means that a revolution is imminent. She, of course, didn't use the term revolution, but she said just the fact that some people disagree means that the science can't really be that accurate or that correct, or no one would disagree with it. So invoking this idea of revolution that maybe science will eventually change its mind. The last group are the harmonizers. And in my typology, of course, I mentioned it's a, it's a spectrum of Christian environmental attitudes. And while the separators and bargainers are climate skeptics, the harmonizers instead represent that creation care movement um, within Christianity. The harmonizers see harmony and alignment between their faith and climate science. They, as the name implies, use metaphors of harmony instead of war and revolution. They emphasize collaboration uh, between different groups and they bridge differences, whereas you might see opposition or, or difference or incompatibility, harmonizers bridge. Um, those issues. So I'll look at, I'll share some examples um, of text. The uh, exemplar harmonizer is the Evangelical Environmental um, Network, and they argue that the creation which God intended is a symphony of individual creatures in harmonious relationships. So this quote was in what in part inspired me to call this category the, the harmonizer. Um, in their Evangelical Declaration on Climate Change, the Evangelical Environmental Network said, we invite Christians to join with us to become a covenant of people in an ever widening circle. They talk about listening and working with others and to share with others our convictions. So again, this emphasis on collaboration and bringing people together. 
a conversation I had with Anthony, again, a pseudonym who I labeled a, a categorized as a harmonizer, saw compatibility between environmentalism and his conservative political traditions. He said that he uh, was an environmentalist because of his stance on being pro-life. He thought that the uh, sort of traditional way of viewing pro-life as being only about uh, life until conception, uh, until birth, from, from conception um, till birth, was too limiting. Instead, his environmentalism drew him to draw a much bigger circumference around what pro-life means. And he defined it as uh, non-human life in addition to human life, and then human life beyond birth. Uh, so the idea that we wanna build a healthy world so we can be pro-life for future generations. So again, bridging, um, ideas that we might not typically see as compatible, harmonizers find those areas of overlap. In my first book, I was interested not only in creating a typology to break down these monolithic categories of Christian and climate skeptic, but I was also interested in what are the practical takeaways from understanding people as being motivated um, by different understandings of the environment and by communicating differently about climate change. Um, so in the book, I conclude with a chapter that details uh, about 10 or so strategies for engaging in climate conversations. So while I can't go through all of them um, with you now, I'll just leave you with my top strategy for all climate conversations from book one before I start talking about my current book project. So my top strategy for all climate conversations is to engage in dialogue. And of course, the term dialogue means two people talking to one another in sort of a public, right, or a personal sphere sense. Uh, but in the technical sphere, dialogue has a very specific meaning in communication and rhetorical studies. And by dialogue, I'm drawing on the work of Richard Johansson, a communication scholar, who argued that a dialogue is indicative of the speaker's attitude towards their audience. So depending on the attitude the speaker holds towards uh, the audience they're speaking with, whether it's one other person or a large group of people, um, can be a dialogue or a monologue. In a dialogue, you view the audience as equals to you, whereas in a monologue, you view yourself as superior to an audience. So if you've ever been lectured to or anyone's been patronizing to you or has talked down to you, you're likely engaged in a speaker who views you or has taken the attitude of a monologue towards the situation. But if you're in a conversation or even in a classroom and the speaker values you as an equal, is interested in your input um, and, and takes a, a perspective towards you as being an equal, that is what dialogue means. So how do we do that? <laughs> how might we engage in a dialogue as a speaker? So um, there are three components to that. The first is valuing the other. The second is asking questions. And the third is offering oneself. And I'll explain each of these in a little bit more detail now. So again, in terms of dialogue and monologue, you wanna em embrace um, a dialogue by valuing and seeing your audience as equals. Uh, Johansson argued, while the speaker may express judgment of policies and behaviors, judgment of the intrinsic worth of audience members is avoided. And I tried to embody this dialogue when I had conversations with climate skeptics and Christians for the first book. Even though I knew for some, some of them walking into the conversation, we were going to really disagree on a lot of aspects of climate change. I still tried to go into the conversation valuing the other person, seeing them as an equal um, and wanting to engage with them as a person. Another way you can engage in dialogue is to ask questions. Don't let it be a monologue where only one person is talking or have it be a lecture. And part of asking questions is not assuming information about your audience and seeking to gain knowledge from them. Uh, don't assume you have all the answers and don't assume you know what someone thinks or why they think that way. Uh, this one, this asking questions strategy could also just be be curious, right? And interested in who you're talking to. And then the last uh, part of dialogue is offering oneself up to be vulnerable. And that's based on the work um, of Jean Goodwin and Michael Dahlstrom, who, are, who talked about conversations with climate skeptics as well. And they mentioned that earning trust from doubtful and dismissive audiences can occur through a strategy of accepting vulnerability. 
And in, it's a great article, but in a nutshell, they argue that if someone is wrong about something or they're learning information about something, it's an incredibly vulnerable position to be in. And they're putting a lot of trust into the other person to steer them in the right direction or give them accurate information. So if you want that trust from your audience and you want that vulnerability from them, you must be willing to be vulnerable as well. So even though you're not necessarily open to changing your mind about climate science, maybe you're open, open to listening to the arguments from the other side, you're open to being wrong or to having to look up an answer. Uh, one bargainer that I spoke with in the book wanted to, me to read an article that he had um, from a climate skeptical source. And I said, yes, I'll read it. And how about I send you one and then we can read them and then chat again about what we read. So it's about accepting right that information and being open and vulnerable um, to your dialogue partners. So to sum up this part of the presentation, I'll just talk a little bit about some of those, these broader conclusions of the book. The first is, of course, to consider climate skeptics and Christians not as homogenous or monolithic uh, or deterministic, but as complicated and varied. And I was also hoping to give the impression that individual conversations we might have with people can be scaled up to how we approach public conversations. We, of course, can't have individual conversations with everyone. And also, there's no one message that's going to work for everyone. So thinking about how can we um, take more of a meso level, group level approach, understand different categories of ways that people make sense of or talk about climate change um, and approach in, in that type of sense. I'm also interested in these strategies potentially being applied across topics. After this book was published um, and into the COVID-19 pandemic, I was asked to write an article for the conversation that applied strategies from my book to COVID conversations. So thinking about how these might be strategies for climate conversations, but maybe other scientific or non-scientific conversations writ large. So in moving from book one in 2019 uh, to right now and in 2023, I've been working on transitioning from, uh, transitioning into a second book project. And this was motivated by a few things. Uh, the first was the prevalence of storytelling in, uh, in the interviews I had with people for book one, people discussing their views on the environment or experiences that changed their minds. They'd often tell stories about their childhood, a really formative memory, or they they talk about relationships that they had, and they were really relying on storytelling to communicate why they felt a certain way about the environment. So that practical experience from the book, and then also growing research that what we call the information deficit model doesn't fully explain gaps between public sphere and technical sphere belief. And the information deficit model simply says, the technical sphere has a lot of information and the public sphere doesn't have a lot of information. So we need to give them more information and then they'll agree with the technical sphere. Um, and there's been many studies um, to, to provide evidence that that's truly not the case, that just providing more information does not necessarily lead to a belief in climate change or really any other scientific topic. So in this current book project, Science versus Story, I'm interested in the questions, is science a story or is science communication a story? Uh, should we use stories in our science communication? And then what can we learn from rival stories, which are sort of uh, non-scientific or uh, adjacent to the mainstream version of, of science's stories in order to strengthen um, science's storytelling. So in answering the question, is science a story? I'm very much informed by the work of rhetorician Walter Fisher and then indigenous and cultural rhetoric scholars such as Leanne Simpson and Asia Martinez. Walter Fisher provides a quite a broad definition of story. He defines it as words and or deeds that have sequence and meaning for those who live, create, or interpret them. And if that sounds really broad and all encompassing, you're exactly right. Fisher thought any form of communication is a story. For Fisher right now, I'm telling a story about my research, right? And who I am as a scholar. Uh, for Fisher, all communication is a form of story. And I wanted to adopt um, that perspective. And of course, uh, Leanne Simpson, Asia Martinez and other scholars of um, indigenous rhetorics and cultural rhetorics talk about the importance of storytelling, not only for meaning making, but knowledge building and relationship building. Stories interconnect us. 
uh, to the past and the future, to our heritage and ancestry. They build knowledge, create knowledge, and can also be a form of, of information transfer. So thinking about just the value and importance of stories and how pervasive stories are. So in thinking about is science a story, it's a little bit of a false binary to me in asking the question and being a little bit cheeky because a lot of people think, okay, this thing is a story, that's not a story, right? A fairy tale is a story, a recipe is not a story. That movie I watched is a story, but maybe my science textbook is not a story, right? But I wanna sort of push back against this idea that we can create such um, binary categories of story, non-story. And in the book instead, I propose a scale of narrativity where communication is either more or less story-like. And by story-like, I mean it has narrative features that we expect stories to have. And I'm gonna go into more detail on that in just a little bit. I will briefly say that there are certainly scholars that disagree with this idea that we should use stories in science communication. So now we have the definition of story. I'm arguing science and science communication is a story. The sort of follow-up question is, should we use stories in science? Um, and some, some folks argue no. For example, historian Alex Rosenberg argued that the lens of narrative distorts what we see. So if we use narrative to express information, we're necessarily introducing falsehoods into information. So Rosenberg argues we should not turn to narrative. Communication scholars, Michael Dahlstrom and Shirley Ho, also caution against using stories because they argue that narratives introduce subjectivity into information transfer rather than the, uh, the objective certainty of science. So we have some scholars who say flat out no or caution against using stories in science. But we also have lots of evidence that stories uh, can be extremely effective in communicating science. For example, for Dillo and Weber, they found that narratives promoted action. When people were given stories about the need for organs in their community, they found that people were more likely to sign up to be organ donors. Hart and Nisbet found that when people identified with characters in a story, it shortened the distance between themselves and climate change. So they saw climate change more relevant to them and that led to support for climate mitigation policy. In a study I published with a friend and colleague of mine, Leanne Sangalang, we found that stories can overcome political roadblocks and even those um, uninclined to uh, agree with climate change can be connected to environmental messages using the vehicle of storytelling. I was also influenced to answer this question in the affirmative that we should use stories in science communication by St. Augustine's On Christian Doctrine. And this is a piece I assign in all of my rhetorical theory classes. Um, and in it, and part of it, St. Augustine argues, is arguing about whether uh, Christians should use rhetoric to evangelize the faith. And many people at the time were concerned that rhetoric, or as I mentioned before, right, the use of symbols to influence, persuade, and connect with others was evil. It was used by paganists. It wasn't something that was godly. And St. Augustine said, no, actually, rhetoric is a tool. It's neutral in and of itself, and we can infuse it with the values and intentions of the wielder and use it for good in service of God. And I think of story the same way. Some people might use stories negatively to mislead or deceive or introduce falsehoods as Rosenberg and Dahlstrom and Ho argue, but story could also be wielded for good. And I think it is a tool that we should wield for good, um, both for and against science. And by that, I mean, oftentimes I'm talking about using story to advocate for science and scientific information. We should also remember that a lot of evil has been done in service of the term uh, science as well. So not to be um, too um, not to be too straightforward here in terms of only thinking about one way of using story, but that story itself can be wielded as a tool for good based on the intentions of the wielder. Even if we don't want to use uh, stories for science communication, the truth is is that other people are, right? Other groups and other institutions are. There are circulating stories about science from our personal networks, politics, news media, religion, and the economy. So really for me, leaning into the power of narrative and storytelling is giving science one more tool to think about um, how it can compete uh, with what we might call rival stories um, to express information.
So in the book, I talk about six narrative features that I've identified that make something more or less story-like along that scale of narrativity. And in the book, I plan on talking about four case studies, evolution, climate change, vaccines, and COVID-19. Um, of course, we only have about, um, I think, 10, 15 minutes left in my presentation now. So I'm only going to focus on characters and climate change to give you a little bit of taste of what the book is going to look like. So in thinking about science as stories of climate change, we might think about a generic story about uh, there's a scientific consensus that recognizes climate change as anthropogenic and severe. There are a lot of different sources, such as industry and agriculture, that release carbon dioxide, uh, which disrupts weather systems, leads to drastic warming, and irreversible damage to our ecosystems. But that's not the only story or set of stories being told um, about climate change. In the book, I talk about rival stories to climate change, uh, namely neoliberalism and fundamental religious environmentalism. Um, again, for this talk, I'll just talk about the second um, to be on theme here. And our exemplar of this category is the Cornwall Alliance, who you might remember as our friend, the exemplar separator. So in comparing science's stories versus this more fundamental religious environmentalism story and focusing on characters, again, which we've narrowed for this talk here, we might ask who are the characters, what is their role in the story, and what are they required to do? In science's version of uh, climate change stories, the characters are oftentimes absent or they're spoken about in the collective. Um, and in either of these ways, it's hard for audience members and individuals to connect with and identify with someone in the story. So just as an example of what I'm talking about in terms of absent and collective characters, the Nature Conservancy argues the average temperature of the Earth's atmosphere is rising. As the temperature rises, various impacts are changing aspects of our climate. Um, and I could have pulled this from many sources, right? The, this is a, sort of a, a general description of climate change that you can see across a bunch of scientific and technical texts. But you'll see that there's not really anyone doing anything um, in, this, um, in this sort of brief description here. Even the Earth isn't really taking on a character role in doing anything. It's just about temperature sort of rising and happening. So we don't get that character connection. And again, that's very common across the texts I looked at. Uh, an example of collective characters, you might take uh, these examples from a NASA website on climate change where they wrote, research has found, multiple lines of evidence indicate, and science has known for some time. So again, thinking about the hundreds or even thousands of folks who are implicated in this idea of research or evidence or science, uh, don't get named, don't get to be characters, but they're talked about in this abstract collective that's doing an action um, or, has re or is reaching a conclusion. Alternatively, in the Cornwall Alliance's story of climate change, there are clear identifiable, and identifiable characters. There is, of course, the only true God, his one and only son, Jesus Christ, um, who rules at all times and places. And uh, the audience of the story as individuals um, are part of the narrative. They have the choice of following God um, and his wishes or not. So they're implicated as part of the story and there are clear characters um, for audiences to follow. So let's now go to the question, what is their role in the story, the characters, or, or really what I mean here is what is the audience's role in the story? Um, in the climate change story, people are blameworthy and in some cases even villains. Writer Mihan Christ argued that the climate change, is, excuse me, that climate change story has a villain problem. When writing our climate story, we must ask who would its heroes be fighting against ourselves? And it has a villain problem um, because it's human actions that have um, pretty much in an, in entirely uh, created the environmental crisis that we're currently in. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency, for example, notes climate change is due to burning fossil fuels, which people use to generate electricity, heat and cool buildings, and power vehicles. Um, so this list might seem fairly innocuous, but now we're implicating just the daily activities and the daily lives of individuals as leading to the climate crisis. And while this is, of course, technically accurate, it's telling a story in a way um, that people are to blame uh, for these actions. So putting audiences in a blameworthy or even villain position in the story. Alternatively, for the Cornwall Alliance, 
uh, individuals, audience members in the story are proper stewards. Um, in the Cornwall Alliance's story, people cannot influence the Earth system. They argue that the Earth is robust, resilient, and self-correcting, so we are not powerful enough to affect the Earth. Instead, we are proper stewards by being fruitful, multiplying, filling the Earth, and subduing it. The Cornwall Alliance denies that human dominion over the Earth is, in principle, sinful. So instead of being sinful or blameworthy, um, in the Cornwall Alliance's story, we are proper stewards of the environment by simply living our day-to-day -day lives. So what are the characters in the story or the audience required to do? In science's story, we're really asked to sacrifice things for the greater good, either for the collective community or for long-term results. For example, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change noted that effective mitigation will not be achieved if individual agents advance their own interests independently. In a 2006 survey, Anthony Lazarowitz found that 90% of survey respondents agreed that the U.S. should reduce its carbon emissions. But alternatively, when specific policy changes were discussed, support plummeted. Anything considered a direct pocketbook issue, like raising taxes, led to decreases from 90 to 31 or even 17% support. So what I take from this survey is that we might genuinely want uh, to advocate for policies that will reduce climate change, but suddenly once it's time to sacrifice ourselves or make any changes, it's much harder to actually commit to those. Um, alternatively, in the Cornwall Alliance's story, uh, humans aren't really required to do anything. Audiences are simply allowed to continue in their godly dominion um, and be masters of the earth. Indeed, one of the Cornwall Alliance's statement um, on their beliefs is that one way of exercising godly dominion is to transform raw materials into resources. So again, building up this idea of industry and consumption um, as godly. So no sacrifice and no changes really to our everyday lives are needed. So this is just a side-by-side -side of the three points we talked about, about who are, who are the characters, what's their role in the story, and what are they required to do? And we can see just in this simple example here, um, differences in the narrative features um, in terms of character uh, between each of these stories. And I argue that the Cornwall Alliance's story is much more story-like, and the science the stories of climate change are less story-like. And that's one obstacle to communicate communicating climate change information um, to the public, especially when there are competing stories also circulating. So similar to my first book, I hope to not just analyze the rhetoric and the discourse circulating about climate change, but I want to know what are the practical takeaways um, of these comparisons. So I ask, what can we learn from religious environmental stories um, based on this category of characters? We can add individuals as characters, position those characters as heroes, pair sacrifice with benefits, and locate storyteller overlaps. So one thing we can do is then add individuals as characters. Instead of these absent collective characters, let's talk about individual scientists or individual people who are affected by climate change. Uh, Gustafsson et al. argues that uh, when people were given personal accounts about how climate change has affected a place that they cared about, that positively affected their global warming beliefs and risk perceptions. Um, in this picture, in the, the lower part of this PowerPoint, it's an image taken from the Climate Stories map, which is an online repository where people can drop a pin where they live and then write a narrative about their experiences with nature or their understanding of climate change. It's a way to add a personal perspective on, well, climate change is not just this far off thing. It's happening and affecting people right now. Um, and I really like this tweet um, in the top here, which is a screen grab of a tweet with the hashtag actual living scientist. And it's this idea of sharing um, science through talking about individual scientists, you know, doing their research and interacting with communities, so humanizing science. So we can also position characters, our audience, as heroes. Uh, this is a, a logo from the Citizen Science Alliance, which is a group that um, helps connect researchers in the technical sphere to members of the public to help um, produce data uh, for scientific research. So for example, the Cornell Ornithology Lab 
uh, allows uh, individuals to track bird migration patterns in their backyard, and that gets aggregated up uh, to scientists who have now access to much more data than they'd otherwise have access to um, in order to track bird patterns and see how climate change is affecting migration. So again, connecting individual people um, to important areas of research can be a way to emphasize you know, the heroic way that people can help um, in terms of climate science. Um, and I really like this ad just because of the tagline, be a climate hero. Uh, this idea that our everyday interactions or everyday purchases can be uh, touch points where we can make a decision uh, to support the environment. Uh, the third way uh, we can improve sort of the characters in climate change's stories is to pair sacrifice with benefits. Rhetorician Jeannie Feinstock talked about the importance of application or emphasizing in science communication how a scientific innovation or piece of information will improve people's everyday lives. You are all probably familiar with the Green New Deal, which is the technical sphere document right, given to policymakers um, in order to enact certain um, policy and economic changes. But you might not be familiar with the video version that she made, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez made to accompany the Green New Deal. Uh, it's a, called A Message from the Future with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And in the video, she is playing herself from the future as an older woman, talking about all the great things that happened once we had passed the Green New Deal. So it's sort of this future retrospective where she's talking about all the jobs that were created, all the renewable energy, all the policy changes, um, the shifts that happened. So it's thinking about, yes, there might be some sacrifice or there might be some changes, but there's immense benefits that are gonna come with that as well. And then my final suggestion for um, improving climate change's uh, characters is to think about storyteller overlaps. Are there ways we can introduce characters into the story through our storytellers? For example, people like Pope Francis who can go between and talk about the importance of the environment and the importance of faith um, to bridge differences between that fundamental religious um, environmentalism narrative and science's narrative. Uh, similarly, I think of people like Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, who is an evangelical and climate scientist as Texas Tech, who can talk uh, explicitly to scientific audiences uh, and also religious audiences and think about uh, creating these overlaps or these bridges between communities. So the broader conclusions of book two is to push back against the very title of the book, Science Versus Story, and think about science and stories. How can we understand the stories that science is telling and lean into narrative features to make science communication more story-like? And for me, I'm, I'm arguing that that will help us to better, will help science to better compete or find compatibility with other circulating stories and make science communication more engaging. So I'll just take one quick second uh, to conclude here with some updates on current projects I'm, I'm working on. Again, I'm currently doing revisions on science versus story with a tentative fall 2023 publication with UC Press, University of California Press. So stay tuned on that. I'm also in the very early stages of working on an edited volume about environmental change makers and activists. And I'm so thrilled that Drs. Crandall and Cunningham are a part of that edited collection. Um, and I'm also the co-founder and co-director of the Public Communication Initiative at UNLV. My passion for finding and locating strategies in um, in commun climate communication research led me to found this center, which does original research into bridging the public and technical divide in terms of um, you know, research best practices. And I'm so thrilled that we just had our first publication um, with one of our uh, student research assistants, Hannah Pattenaud, uh, which was talking about bridging divides between technical and public spheres on the topic of nuclear energy. Um, and in addition to research, the group also provides workshops uh, to groups, namely academics, but other technical groups on public communication skills and how to translate their research um, for public audiences. So, so with that, I'm going to again say thank you so much um, for having me. I apologize again for the, for the brief technical difficulties, but here's all my contact information. I have a website and I have the PCI's website up there now as well. And then I'm really thrilled to continue the conversation. So thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Bloomfield. Let's all give her a wonderful round of applause. It's one of the dissatisfying things about, about doing it in this venue that you don't hear a raucous room full of applause. We had well over 100 people with us uh, tonight. And as folks are thinking about their questions, please put them in the Q&A. I'd like to invite a couple of colleagues uh, to consider uh, joining us. You mentioned uh, Dr. Crandall, uh, who I'm going to make a panelist here, and also Dr. Cunningham. There are two of my colleagues here at Gonzaga. Dr. Cunningham is a uh, professor of communication and leadership studies here at Gonzaga, and Dr. Crandall is a uh, professor of communication studies and the chair of that department. Welcome, colleagues. Um, you know, I was writing to you while Dr. Bloomfield was talking, and they're like, hey, you want to jump on just to have a, a conversation? It was your idea to invite Dr. Bloomfield here tonight? It's, uh, and it's appropriate to invite you into the conversation, but thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. That was uh, it was so great to hear your overview of um, what you've been working on, what you find, and what you're working on next. It's just it's wonderful to to yeah, have you here you. with us to share your expertise. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> I wanted to chime in to uh, Dr. Bloomfield. It's been really fun to work with you on the current project you were mentioning with the environmental change makers because one of the things that um, Heather and I found in our research is telling the story of climate change is so important um, to make change and different audiences. And I think this is what you are um, alluding to react to different kinds of stories, right? There's some stories that maybe we all can relate to, but then there's some stories that we need to kind of adapt for different audiences. And as you were talking, I was wondering, could you describe how the story of climate change has morphed over the years? Or have you seen some trends in terms of you know, you were saying it's become much more scientific in the way that stories are told about um, the climate crisis, but I feel like that's more of a new trend because it seems like the science really needs to become forefront for some of these skeptics audiences. So I just thought, I was wondering if you could comment on that a little bit. Yes, absolutely. I think there are, it's, well, the first thing is it's really hard to say there's one monolithic story of climate change, because of course there's so many stories that we're telling about climate change. So I was really trying to get at the stories that that technical uh, groups were telling about climate change. So I pulled data from the EPA, from NASA, you know, kind of established groups. For my other controversies, I had sort of the, the CDC, right, and other sort of official voices. So you're exactly right. It's really hard to say that there's any sort of uh, specific trends. I certainly see people um, advocating for, of course, sharing scientific information, data, statistics. And I think that's still important. Um, but for me, I would say we shouldn't always lead with that. And that shouldn't be the only thing we do, because sometimes statistics and facts aren't the most persuasive for our audiences. It, it's a bit uh, ironic or counterintuitive that there are some studies that show actually the more information people have about these topics, the less likely they are to agree with science. And that's not to say that the more educated you are, the less you agree with scientists. But that if you are a skeptic, you actually have to do more research to justify your positioning. So you tend to know a little bit more about these topics than folks that who, who already agree, right, and, and have those beliefs. So I think it's hard to say, to get back to your question, if there's sort of a necessary trend that stories are getting more scientific or more technical. I think they tend to swing back and forth. People experiment, right, with different strategies to try to connect with people. I do know that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, is trying to incorporate more storytelling into its summary for policymakers. So some groups are making more of these um, explicit efforts to aim at public audiences. All right, let's uh, feel free, colleagues, to jump in, uh, but I'm going to start posing some questions. We've got a, a question in the Q&A. Uh, John asks, are we hardwired to turn everything into a story? Or is it simply an easier way of compressing information for communication? That is a really great question. The I believe that um, people fall into different camps. I do think there's some hardwiring in the sense um, that uh, the way that we've developed how we communicate right, um, has followed this trend of stories. And because then we use stories, it then creates this feedback loop where now that's the way that we think of sharing information as being the most, um, the easiest, as you said, or the, the easiest to compress. Uh, Walter Fisher called humans, instead of homo sapiens, homo narens, 
he thought it was really ingrained in being human that we are the storytelling animal um, instead of just the wise animal. And there's, of course, been a lot of different things people say about you know, Homo economicus, right? We are the economic animal or the tool using animal. So there's lots of ways to, to think about defining us. But some people do believe, yeah, storytelling is really hardwired um, in how we communicate. I'm not necessarily um, that level of deterministic in terms of psychology and how our brain is wired. But I do believe that the history of humans, we've developed the skill for storytelling, which then creates that feedback loop that that's what we're more likely to use and what we sort of default to. Um, and it is. It's really easy. It's an easy way to compress information, as you say. Um, so why wouldn't we use a tool that's really easily accessible to us and, and comes naturally? Great question. I've got a, an anonymous uh, question uh, in the chat that I'll, I'll pose to you. So this person's interested in how you would apply your work to approaching family members with a mindset that's very uncompromising and not open to climate change being a real issue. I, I hear this a lot from my students and, and friends. And so I, I think a lot of people out there maybe are, are curious what someone who works in climate communication and rhetoric would say. Um, I don't know, how do you deal with Uncle Uncle Bob? Uh, that's that's my question. Yeah, it's really interesting. That is by far the most common question I get from journalists when I'm asked about my research. I did an article for Gris that was help. There's a climate denier at the Thanksgiving table. And, and so I think um, my book talks about a lot of these strategies, my first book um, that I developed in, in talking to individuals. Um, the first I'll just say is it's really difficult. I mean, people don't come to these conclusions flippantly or easily or quickly. Um, there's oftentimes a lot of um, ideological um, influence. So by that, I'll say, um, you know, things like politics, things like religion, things like economics, where you grew up, your, your social networks, those all influence our beliefs on climate change. So to go into any conversation and think, oh, I'm going to say the magic words and in this one conversation, I'm going to change their mind, probably not. Um, but I will say that there were folks I interviewed for, um, uh, for my book that I was in conversations with for months afterwards. I think it's, it's really a process of being open, being vulnerable, um, asking questions and being curious that can kind of plant these seeds that can later blossom into changed opinions. If I were in a conversation with a family member who didn't believe in climate change, I would definitely ask questions. Well, why don't you believe in climate change? Uh, what sources are you reading? Where did you hear that from? Um, do you want to hear my thoughts on that? Definitely frame it as a personal thing. This is why it's important to you. Center values that you share with the other person. Maybe tell a story about a childhood experience with the environment. Better yet, that person you're talking to is in that story, right, of a canoeing trip you took or a hike that you went on. Um, talking about why you care about the environment and why it's important to you. If that family member cares about you and, and has thought about their beliefs, it just opens up that dialogue and exchange um, of information. So I think it would be a slow process. You'd certainly want to go into it as a dialogue and, and not as a lecture. Uh, but I think there's definitely ways you can open up doorways um, to say, hey, I'm open to talk about this and it's really important to me and, and I hope it's important to you too. Good luck. <laughs> Indeed. To See if I could pull in uh, my colleagues a little bit. I'm curious about uh, whether or not, you know, to all three of you, but really whether storytelling is changing with technological changes in, in the way that we tell stories, share stories. Between generations, there seems to be significant differences about how my teenage daughters share stories through Instagram and how, you know, earlier generations thought about and told stories. I'm just curious, uh, especially maybe uh, Dr. Crandall, I know that you are interested in this space in particular, but I just, uh, I don't know, it's just on my mind about, you know, are there generational differences and does that itself create a, a different challenge than just simply focusing on storytelling, but rather like if, if the two sides generationally don't see even storytelling or think of storytelling the same way, does that create yet another layer of problem? I'm not sure if, if you or, or my colleagues have thought about it, but Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just start off really quickly with one, um, with again, with talking about Dr. Cunningham and I's book is that is that generational problem where, so we wrote, our book is about climate girl activists. And a lot of how they became activists was through stories of personal experiences. They um, experienced something, they wanted to do something about it, whether it was 
um, pick a beach cleanup or a citizen journalist, like you were talking about. But anyway, so, so story is how they became activists. And then in, to, to your generational question, I'm just reminded of the um, of the activists themselves were having this problem where they're activists and the adults around them are not uh, taking them seriously. There's a lot of dismissal going on you're just kids. How do you know so much? What makes you think you're so educated in these kinds of um, rhetorical strategies of dismissal? And that was a real separation between, they said, well, we're just going to hang out with the people who get it. And it's it, and we can't be vulnerable about the planet, the demise of the planet with our own parents or family members. So that's all I'll say for now. And I just wanted to add about, I think what you're talking about, um, Brian, is the attention economy, right? So the way that uh, younger generations are orienting to storytelling is very different. And I think it's connected through um, their networks, you know, their their networks they're connected with, um, TikTok, Instagram, all these different ways that they can tell stories across platforms is really interesting uh, to me as well, because different media uh, are able to do different things, right? And so if you're not someone who watches the news or reads the newspaper, maybe you're going to get your information off TikTok and that could be um, influential as well. So I think storytelling has definitely changed. And I, I was curious, I'd love to hear more um, from Dr. Bloomfield about the cultural storytelling, because I think now we're hearing from um, diverse audiences and diverse stories that are being told and um, but they're still resonating and having that fidelity that Fisher talks about. So I'd love to hear a little bit more if, if we have time on that. Uh, um, generational question. I do think that the way we package stories and what kind of form it's in or what kind of medium um, it's in is definitely something to consider. Maybe that Climate Stories Map website wants to do video testimonials, right, in addition to written narratives. So how people consume information, I think, is definitely changing. And it makes sense to think about how can we make bite-sized stories? How do we make videos? How do we make voiceover videos? I think all of that um, is definitely something to be thinking about in terms of then how, once we have a story, how do we actually get it out to people? And I think that is going to be different depending on the generation or audience you're talking to. Um, in terms of the in indigenous storytelling, um, I didn't really have time to go into it too much in this presentation, but I, I am interested in indigenous storytelling as a rival story to science communication. Science can oftentimes be exclusionary and gatekeeping and separate certain understandings of science from others. So when we think about sort of big S science in terms of this institutionalized version of science, it's, of course, very different than a more a traditional ecological knowledge form of science. So in addition to these rival stories that I see as unproductive, such as neoliberalism and this religious fundamentalism, I talk about product, also productive rival stories that might um, help us think about science and expand it in, in really interesting ways. So yeah, I sort of have that balance um, in the larger version of the book, but really important. Go, go buy the book. Okay, so another uh... A uh, question from a shy uh, community member asks um, or states, as a communication practitioner in the science space, I often need to find a balance between stories in which people can see themselves and data that provides a logic model for decision makers. What's your best tip for building ethical and compelling persuasive communication that balances these two things, stories in which people can find themselves and data that provides a logic model for decision makers? Absolutely, it's a great question. And I think it can be really simple. Um, instead of just launching into the data, why not put yourself in the story or put the person who collected the data or created the logic model into the story? You know, this is how the researcher came to this conclusion, or this was the question that fascinated them. When I told the story of my research, I talked about what excited me and made me passionate. Um, about doing this work. So even something as simple as that is just humanizing the people behind that data or that logic that you're talking about can be a way to say, oh, okay, there's a person behind that who's doing research or creating a model or you as the storyteller as a character in the story as you're coming to a realization about something interesting. Um, something as simple as that can be a way to just say the audience can identify um, with you or a character in the narrative. I would always say 
um, that data is good, right? Information is good. We don't want to fully replace all of that um, with more story-like content. But as you said exactly in this question, it is definitely about balance and not over relying on the data. So that's all that you're giving to people. Instead, story can be that vehicle or that container that you're using to share that information with others. I might use this as an opportunity to pose a question that I could imagine one of my colleagues in, in um, biology or chemistry here at Gonzaga mm. pushing back and, and suggesting um, that you know they're trained to remove themselves as much as possible from their understanding of phenomena in order to try and understand them uh, without influencing them as much as possible. Uh, and so uh, would you draw a distinction between communicating science as opposed to science as a story? It seems to me that it's um, maybe two different things that mm -hmm. communicating what science is under, you know, coming to discover, is that something different than the doing of science because i suspect they would chafe at the idea that science is itself like our understanding of the physical world is another story just like any other now i know that's a diminutive for of saying just a story but i'm i'm wondering that is there a distinction to be made between science communication and science or would you not want to have that distinction this is a really great question so i'll give you the two minute version of the entire course i teach on this called the rhetoric of science so we, uh, so I say that there are two forms of uh, science rhetoric, internal and external. So when you talk about science communication, you're talking about external rhetoric, scientists talking to the public, right, translating information for the public. But scientists also participate in rhetoric internally. I would say to a scientist who's trained to remove themselves completely from the process, you may be doing that, but that's still a choice you're making as a human. Um, and so, so human decision making is always part and parcel of the scientific process. So internal scientific rhetoric might be applying for grants. You have to persuade people that your research project is a good idea. Writing papers, you're communicating results, but you're also persuading reviewers and your audience that you did the data collection and the methods accurately, so they should trust your information. So I would say that science itself is a form of rhetoric and storytelling. But the one I'm most interested in in the book is that external communication, um, where science communication can lean into more narrative elements. I'll have to take your class. That sounds fun. Thank you. But I understand the chafing. I absolutely understand the pushback I get from scientists. Oh, it's a full um, because we don't breaking out think... in hives. It's it's a yes. It's... <laughs> oh yeah. Because we don't want to think about that. Because when we introduce people, we introduce bias and subjectivity which is why those, those no voters on should we use science say the same things. They want a caution story because that means people are there making decisions and their subjectivity. And we want to think of science as fully objective and fully certain. And I want to yeah. sort of push back against that as something that is good that we should rely on. And if we had more time and, and sure. a, an adult <laughs> beverage, we would talk about sort of post-truth, you know, sort of, you know, post-modern sort of uh, elements of Absolutely. Of this conversation and the difficulty that science finds itself in. But we will resist that urge. Uh, but we'll resist that urge. Um, perhaps, let's see, we have a, another question. Perhaps tell the story of how you get the data rather than starting with the conclusion. Let me say that again. So Francis says, perhaps we should tell the story of how you get the data. I think that's what you were saying. Rather than starting with the conclusion, a deductive model, take your audience on the journey with you inductively, then the presentation is itself narrative and form. I guess that's more of a comment, sort of observation. I agree that's, completely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly uh, Molly right. says, it seems the fundamentalists have little problems with saying that they are sinners and have done bad things. Why uh, might we, or I'm sorry, might we say hurting Mother Earth uh, becomes convincing as sinful to them? So just sort of, and I think actually some evangelical communities have represented in in that mm -hmm. way, but um, I'm not sure if that's a rhetorical question necessarily. It more, seems like more a theological question, but I could be wrong. Well, it's interesting because in uh, book one, in the Harmonizers chapter, I talk about people I spoke to conceptualize uh, the exploitation of the environment as a sin. A lot of people talked about the sin of gluttony, right? Overconsumption, not just eating food, but just consumption in general um, as a type of cardinal sin of pride, um, thinking of ourselves as more important than the earth. Um, so people did a sloth, laziness, not wanting to act on the environment. So harmonizers were conceptualizing 
their understanding um, of environmental exploitation through sort of sin, what we would think of as traditionally sinful language. Um, I do think you're correct that in certain circumstances, um, sort of fundamentalists might um, uh, latch onto that, that sinner identity, but that tends to be, I think, more personal um, decisions that people are making as opposed to these collective decisions um, that we're talking about in climate change, at least that I saw groups like the Cornwall Alliance are really thinking about, you know, are humans by nature sinful because of how they treat the environment? They tend to say no, though they might certainly say individual actions, right, would lead to that um, sinful um, that behavior, yeah. It, it reminds me of another version of, I could pose a version of the science question from the perspective of evangelical Christianity. So if some scientists want to say that, you know, they uh -huh. just do objective research, some fundamentals would say, you know, the Bible's not a story. It's it's the little true, you know, word of God. And so yes. um part of my sort of another version of the question I guess I have in mind is um why is it have you done any research on why it is that Protestant evangelicals in particular have a particular different orientation to their creation stories and their and their key sort of um religious narratives that's different than uh, Catholics, or uh, that there's a different status within those religious traditions that the role of those narratives, those stories play, that seem to result in different attitudes and orientations towards science, towards, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's not maybe an accident that Pope Francis has got a different view than uh, the Catholic Church has a different view and has for, for quite a long time compared to evangelical traditions. I'm not sure, did that come out in, in your research or your book? So in the book, I didn't explicitly ask people their denomination because I didn't think I would get enough folks. I got over 100, but I didn't think I'd get enough folks to draw sort of strict um, conclusions on different denominations. But I know from my sociology courses, um, folks like Emil Durkheim talk about the, the personal relationship between people and faith versus faith um, like Catholic faith that, of course, still have a personal relationship, but there's oftentimes mediators. So people like bishops, archbishops, and the Pope, who also kind of serve this guiding role in, in, in discussing information and giving um, um, advice and mandate. So that can create a different type of relationship um, between folks um, and their religious leaders. Um, so I do think that that can potentially be part of uh, this story. But again, everything is is very particular I uh, and individual for people. I spoke to uh, someone for book one who was a separator, and he greatly disagreed with the words of Pope Francis and was not convinced by Laudato Si um, that we should care about the earth. So even within right faiths, we have a lot of differences in terms of leaders and authority figures and, and values that we share. Good point. Well, colleagues, um, I, I want to fill these last two minutes with any any final um, comments or thoughts before uh, we wrap up. I hope I you all have more climate conversations <laughs> and you take on that risk. Yeah. Well, and and this talk just really um, just inspires me to say, how do we tell better stories? Because right. it, it they really are going to inspire change if we're able to communicate to different audiences and have that um, connection to create dialogue. So I'm really inspired by the work that you're doing, Dr. Bloomfield. Oh, thank you. That's my hope. <laughs> Um, and this is just one one last thing, which is that in addition to telling better stories, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, is there a space for the public sphere to pressure the technical sphere? And, 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 and I know it sounds like you're working on that a little bit, but that information that you brought up where more information is not necessarily the right way to go. So it. So that was just uh, that that pressuring, organizing to pressure for different kinds of stories out of the technical sphere. I don't know if that's. Yeah, I think absolutely we can emphasize kind of bridges between technical and public spheres, science journalists, right, folks who are educators working in these in-between spaces, and of course demanding, right, more stories or more forms of information. Tell the IPCC, we don't want your summary for policymakers, we want a video or we want a newsletter, right? I think there are definitely ways people can demand uh, more stories or help be co-creators of those stories. It's such a wonderful problem for educators to realize that uh, just educate, like just informing people is actually not, not, <laughs> we have a bigger job that it's not just a matter of not, not that alone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's also a message for ourselves as educators to, to, to take this on board and, and, and appreciate the difficulty of, of this for our task uh, with our, with our students and our communities. So thank you so much.
uh, for being with us tonight. We really appreciate you uh, sharing with the, the Climate Center tonight. Um, Thank you. Just as a reminder, uh, we do have several more events that you can go to gonzaga.edu slash Climate Center events and register. Uh, our next event is on the 24th with uh, author and activist uh, Paul Kings North on Confessions of a Recovering Environmentalist um, and as many of these others. And of course, if you have the means and opportunity to please consider uh, supporting us at gonzaga.edu slash support climate center. Uh, thank you all so much for being with us tonight. And uh, again, thank you so much to Dr. Bloomfield for joining us from UNLV. We um, really appreciate your research and sharing it with us.